Okay, so let's be honest. I did not expect that deck to do as well as it did. I didn't expect you guys to enjoy that deck anywhere near as much as you apparently did. For context, I usually expect a video to make one to 2,000 views, unless I'm talking about something super topical like the Amazon fiasco. Uh, but for some reason, this video, the Oops All Lieutenants video, where I talked about a commander that I wasn't able to get working when the pre-cons came out, yeah, apparently that's the deck that y'all ended up all looking at and liking. I don't understand it, I don't get it, but it did make me realize I really want to make a full power version of that deck. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk once more about Sauron, Lord of the Rings, but this time without a definitive budget. Let's play full power, oops, all lieutenants. Sauron, Lord of the Rings, is a 5 mana and Grixis 9-9 nine, nine amazing beast of a commander. When you cast him, amass 5 orcs, which means you get a 5-5 five, five orc token effectively, mill 5 cards, and then return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. And, oh, whenever a commander an opponent controls dies, you get the ring tempting you. Not that that really is going to matter all too much for this kind of deck. Okay, so just like last time, when I originally made this deck years ago, uh, I, or a year ago, I didn't enjoy it with him as the commander because I didn't feel like he was doing a lot. Now I realize the trick with this particular commander is to use what's called lieutenants. Uh, this one right here is Jin Kitaxis, and I have the wrong printing on screen. Here is the correct printing. There you go. Now, what is a lieutenant in Magic the Gathering? In my opinion, a lieutenant is any creature or any card, effectively, that either does the thing your commander does so that you don't have to rely exclusively on the commander or otherwise allows the deck to do the thing that it's doing with or without the commander. In this case, our commander reanimates something, but reanimate spells are not lieutenants. Instead, the deck is focusing on these lieutenants. They are going to be the bread and butter on what the deck is trying to accomplish. Our goal is to get a lot of powerful creatures, or even just one powerful creature on the board, that must be answered by removal. And if it is not answered by removal, then we will win the game. So, the strategy here is going to be get a lieutenant into the graveyard and then reanimate the lieutenant with our commander or some other you know, variety of ways of reanimation. There's a lot of options here. And each of these lieutenants needs to be so overwhelmingly powerful that our opponents must get rid of them or they otherwise tempo swing the game so hard in our favor that we are effectively the arch enemy villain of the table. And I keep focusing on this one right here, Jin Kitaxis, because he's the first one we need to talk about. Probably the strongest of all the lieutenants we can pick. Jin here says that anytime we cast an artifact, instant, or sorcery, we get to copy it. And whenever an opponent casts one, we get to counter it. Both of these only happen once per turn, but you can imagine the ways in which a table has to gang up on you to remove something like this. Two removal spells have to be spent, or otherwise people have to dance around this card on their turns, and when your turn comes around, being able to cast a ramp spell twice, a removal spell twice, anything twice with this ability is fantastic. If we summon this up with our commander, we basically have the game in our clutches. And I wanted to continue going on with this theme of the Praetors, so let's go ahead and add another Jin Gitaxis into the mix as well. Jin Gitaxis Core Augur makes every opponent's maximum hand size get reduced by 7. Unless they've got a Reliquary Tower or a Thought Vessel, this is going to cause people to constantly discard their hands, losing all the potential resources they could have to deal with us. Meanwhile, we get to draw seven cards every turn, meaning that we will be the villain with all of the pieces of every puzzle in our hand ready to go. And hell, 
if we're going to be getting all of those advantages, we may as well take our opponent's cards away from them too with Itali Primal Storm. Whenever this attacks, we get to exile the top card of every player's library and then cast those cards without spending their mana value. And if we're going to be the villain, we may as well take their spent cards too. Sepulchral Primordial gets to come onto the board and summon a creature from every opponent's graveyard all at once. Both of these, when they pop onto the board, will tempo swing the game immediately into our favor by giving us so much advantage our opponents can't deal with it. And hell, removing an opponent's important game piece only to yank it away with the Primordial is a dick move. But it's a dick move that we are willing to make. We have an 8 mana commander after all, we need to make up for that... <laughs> That little bit of an issue somewhere. Our commander takes a while to get online, so when it gets online, we're going to hurt you. But back to the Praetors, I want to go ahead and talk about the next one we're going to be running, which is Shieldred. When she touches the battlefield, each opponent will sacrifice a non-token creature or a planeswalker. And of course, we can exile her to flip her into the true scriptures, which will allow us to blow up even more cards and make our opponents lose the cards in their hand and mill cards, which causes psychic damage. And finally, the true scriptures allows us to go into everybody's graveyards and put all of their creatures on our board. An instant win condition without having to try too terribly hard. If Shieldred is not answered immediately, we do win the game. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. We just win the game. So, again, this is a card that must be answered. Another card that must be answered that is a wonderful lieutenant to pair with our commander is Archon of Cruelty. This card comes onto the battlefield, picks an opponent, and yanks out a card from their hand, kills one of their creatures, makes and makes them lose three life. And then we draw a card and gain three life. And of course, we get a 6-6 flying beater on top of all that. This is one of the best tempo swings that has ever been printed for reanimator decks. And I'm so glad the card is less expensive now, thanks to the reprint in Modern Horizons three. But we do have one small issue. If we have such high cost cards, we need ways of getting mana back on our opponent's turn to protect our cards. So let's go ahead and throw Sphinx of the Second Sun in there. If we summon our commander and get our 5-5 orc army and then get a Sphinx, we will immediately refund all of that mana at our end step by getting our second beginning step with the Sphinx, allowing us to protect our board with any of the counter spells we have in our hand. And Sphinx of the Second Sun, if it happens to be on the board with Jin Kataxis creates a wonderfully oppressive scenario where at the end of our turn we can draw seven cards to protect ourselves and also get all the mana back to prevent our opponents from playing any cards. The one card they will get per turn. And if we're going to be playing Grixis villains, we may as well play the big Grixis villain of Magic the Gathering, Nicol Bolas the Ravager. When this touches the battlefield, each opponent will discard a card, which already will put a target on our backs, but if we flip to the backside, Nicol Bolas the Arisen has a draw engine attached to him for his plus two. His negative three deals 10 damage to a creature or a plane walker and his negative four allows us to reanimate anything from any graveyard onto our battlefield and if he happens to hit his negative 12 we then exile everything from a player's great or library except the bottom card they basically lose the game almost on the spot unless the top card of their deck the bottom card of their deck rather is incredibly powerful and swings the game in their favor this will cripple an opponent every single time, and it dodges Shuffle Titans. A Eldrazi Shuffle Titan can't protect you from this because it's already exiling every card. All in all, having the Grixis bad guy of Lord of the Rings summon the Grixis bad guy of Badge of the Gathering is kind of perfect in my opinion, but speaking of bad guys, the most recent villain in Magic the Gathering needs some representation in this deck too, so let's talk about Valgavoth Terror Eater. This flying and lifelink 9-9 Elder Demon has ward that makes an opponent sacrifice three non-land permanents, and if a card we didn't control would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, it gets exiled instead, and during our turn, we may play any card that Valgavoth has exiled and use any mana color to cast it. It's more spell thieving, more villains, and more gigantic problematic cards that our opponents simply will not be able to deal with if they are not ready to gang up on us with everybody. 
But that's not all. Those may be the villains that we are going to be using, the big lieutenants, but we are not done with lieutenants because some of our lieutenants will actually spawn more lieutenants out of the graveyard. I'm talking about Shieldred Whispering One, another Praetor. This Swamp Walk Praetor says that at the beginning of our upkeep, we get to return any creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield, and at the beginning of every opponent's upkeep, that player will sacrifice a creature. And another reanimation lieutenant we get access to is Olivia Crimson Bride. With flying in haste, whenever this thing swings, we will reanimate any creature from our graveyard, with a stipulation that if Olivia dies, the creature will get exiled as well. This is one of our nine ways to reanimate, besides what our commander is already doing, by the way. But every reanimation in here is on theme with what we are doing. Pinnacle Monk allows us to recycle cards, especially reanimation cards, and it is an MDFC, so it gives us perfect access to more things if we need it. Too Greedily Too Deep is effectively a board wipe that also reanimates a creature. Reanimate is, well, reanimate. You pay one mana to reanimate a thing. Animate Dead is the same thing, but you pay two mana and you attach the Animate Dead to that thing. Malakir Rebirth is an MDFC that can replace a creature if it happens to die, and Virtue of Persistence is a removal spell that can also reanimate creatures from anybody's graveyard, allowing us to continue that villain fantasy of being the strongest person at the table, taking everybody's resources all game. And finally, Breach the Multiverse. Again, this is a quintessential villain spell. Mill everybody's deck by 10 cards, causing maximum psychic damage, and then steal the best thing from every person's graveyard. This may be a high mana card, but if we're going to be spending lots of mana to get our commander online anyway, we may as well spend that mana getting everybody's graveyards populated with exactly what we want. And speaking of graveyards, let's talk about how we're going to make our cards hasty with Anger. We have three haste enablers in this deck, and Anger is is one of them. If this is in the graveyard and we have a mountain, all of our creatures get haste. This is super easy to get in the graveyard since our commander mills us and we are going to be trying to get lieutenants in the graveyard with our draw strategies anyway. Anger is kind of a no-brainer. Urobrask the Hidden's also in here to make our opponents lose the ability to have their creatures come into play untapped and also gives all of our creatures haste. And I really wanted to have one more Praetor in the deck because having all these Phyrexian Praetors just seems like a no-brainer. And finally, Rising of the Day, which will give all of the legendary creatures in this deck 1-0 and also give all of our creatures haste. And as an enchantment, it's very hard to remove this from the board. But with all of our creatures punching our opponents over and over again, we do need ways to break parity. So, in lieu of what Anger is doing, we are also going to add Filth and Wonder. Wonder will give all of our creatures flying if we have an island while it's in the graveyard, and Filth will give them all Swamp Walk while it's in the graveyard uh, to similar effect, making sure our opponents will never be able to block our giant cards. We want to make sure that we are always the ones in the driving seat here with our big creatures, and we don't want there to be anything in the way when we know that it's time to end the game and swing on one unsuspecting victim. And speaking of that, we need more ways to haste our guys out, but also protect them. So let's go ahead and toss in a Lightning Greaves and a Swiftfoot Boots. Both of these can keep any of our creatures protected, but we really only want to protect the lieutenants with this. Protecting our commander with this is kind of useless, right? If our commander gets destroyed by something, that's just a new opportunity to recast the commander. Nobody's going to want to kill our commander, so don't try to protect the commander. Let the commander just do its thing for as long as it needs to. That all said, I think you will have a wonderful time with all of these cards, but I do think we need to talk about drawing cards because it is going to be so important for what this deck is trying to do to be able to dig through and get things into the graveyard. So let's go ahead and talk about our draw engine. <laughs> We are running a 14 card draw engine in this deck because we need to get through that much of what our deck is trying to do. So let's go ahead and begin with fact or fiction. Reveal the top five cards of your library and opponent separates those into two piles and you put one into your hand and the other into the graveyard. Super simple to understand and Sauron's Ransom is doing the exact same thing but with a pile of four instead of a bigger pile. 
Hostile Negotiations is effectively doing the same thing for our deck by just exiling the top three cards in two separate piles and giving our opponents a choice between the two piles. One will be face down, one will be face up, and just try to play a psychological game with them. Again, this is a card that makes you feel like a villain because you give people Faustian bargains. But we also need to be able to loot through our deck. So let's go ahead and add in Likeness Looter and Moira Scavenger and Obsessive Stitcher and Mazzalanti the Great Door. Each one of these cards effectively does the same thing, allowing us to draw a card and discard a card at will. But every one of them has a secondary ability I want to note. The Great Door can flip into a land that gives us X mana of any one color, where X is the number of permanents in our grave. Our deck is mostly comprised of permanents, so this will give us lots of mana late into the game if we need it to. The Obsessive Stitcher is another way to reanimate things from the grave. Moira Scavenger allows us to get more Orc army amassing on the board, and Likeness Looter can turn into any of the lieutenants in the grave if we are willing to sink lots of mana into making it into a copy of one of those cards. So each one of these is serving a very, very powerful purpose in our deck. We also are a big mana deck, so let's add Seize the Spoils, Unexpected Windfall, and Big Score in. Each one of these allows us to discard a card and draw cards, but also allows us to create treasure tokens when we do so, which we will be able to use to afford our overcosted commander. Ripples of Undeath allows us to mill our library to get lieutenants in the graveyard, and also counts as a draw on top of that. Brass's Tunnel Grinder benefits from by giving us a descent ability. Anytime we descend, we put a counter on the card, and after we've done so three times, we can flip it into the Searing Rift, which allows us to cast any permanent spell and then give it Discover X, where X is its mana value. If we cast an eight-cost spell, it discovers X and digs into our library until we cast a free thing. Past that, it's just a fantastic card, as it is a wheel when we play it. Speaking of wheels, let's also add in Windfall to make everybody discard their hands and replace them, and Valakut Awakening to let us recycle our own hand and replace it with a new one if we want, with Valakut Awakening being, of course, an MDFC on the back side, so we have access to lands if we do not need this card for its main ability. And that does it for most of the draw. That should dig you through everything in the deck very, very quickly, but that's not enough to make a deck tick. We do need to make sure that we are still removing things from our opponent's board and our lieutenants are not going to be enough to solidify that game plan. So let's talk about removing everything our opponents hold dear, shall we? We are going to be running an 11 card removal and interaction package with room for some more stuff later on down the road, but let's go ahead and talk about the first one, which is negate. This counters any non-creature spell, which is the most important kind of thing to counter in a game of commander. The scariest things people play often aren't creatures, but are the cards that supplement their creatures. Let's also add in some more counter spells with counter spell itself. Arcane Denial, Offer You Can't Refuse, and Sink Into Stupor. Each one of these has the ability to effectively make sure our opponents do not get their spells and do not get to hurt us with them. With the added bonus that Sink Into Stupor is, of course, an MDFC, as well as being a pseudo counter spell bounce spell. Past that, let's make sure that we've got really good uh, modal removal in Withering Torment, Feed the Swarm, and Chaos Warp. Withering Torment and Feed the Swarm can get rid of enchantments and creatures, and Chaos Warp can get rid of any kind of permanent on the board. Let's go ahead and keep modality as a central theme for our removal, though, letting Hagram Mauling and Fell the Profane be our next removal spells. Both of these are four mana kill spells that flip into lands on the backside so they can be whatever we need them to be. Lands to replace our mist land drops or actual real tangible spells. And finally, let's have a Vandal Blast to get rid of all of our opponent's artifacts all at once, because I'm going to be honest, we need ours, they don't need theirs. But we also need some board wipes, so let's go ahead and add a Blasphemous Act, because it's a one-mana board wipe that will easily take care of anything on a given problematic board state, and Toxic Deluge, since we can use this for three mana and get rid of everything except our commander and lieutenant, if our board state allows us to, by only putting in enough life to burn away the lower-costed, lower-toughness creatures. That all said, that should keep our opponents from winning the game long enough for us to get to our game plan. But we do need a modicum of speed still, so let's go ahead and talk about ramping into our giant commander. 
let's go ahead and start off by saying this is a hefty ramp package at 14 cards but again our commander costs eight so it makes sense to make these kind of sacrifices in our deck building to be able to get to that commander and the first of these is going to be relic of sauron for four mana we can add any combination of grixis mana and also we have a draw to discard a card ability for when we don't need the mana we can also add in the two mana mana rocks of talisman of indulgence fell war stone talisman of dominance talisman of creativity and arcane signet each one of these is a easy to use two mana mana rock that really doesn't need a whole lot of explanation but for a little more mana we can add in hedron archive which lets us get two mana but we can sacrifice this card to draw two cards later stone speaker crystal which does the same thing but also gives us the benefit of being able to take away people's graveyards and solemn simulacrum which will grab a basic land out of the deck when we put it on the board and if it dies we get to draw a card wayfarer's bobble also gets to tutor a land into our battlefield if we need it Warren Power Stone can be cast for three mana to give us two mana later on down the line. Treasure Nabber can yank our opponent's favorite ramp cards so that we can use them ourselves. Soul Ring is, um, well, it's Soul Ring. You, you have like 12 billion of these. You've probably wiped your butt with one at this point. But yeah, you got a Soul Ring. Why not? We're big mana commander. And then finally, Realm Breaker the Invasion Tree. Now, Realm Breaker allows us to mill an opponent by three and then put any land from their graveyard onto our battlefield. This is already a very powerful effect that lets us ramp repeatedly and safely on multiple turns. But if we have not seen any of our Praetors throughout a game, there's a secret second thing we can do with this. We can sacrifice Realm Breaker the Invasion Tree in order to search our library for any number of Praetors and put them onto the the battlefield think about it this is ramping us throughout the game and if we just so happen to not see our shieldreds our urbrasks and our gen Gitaxes, we get to crack this and go yeah here's shieldred the whispering one i hope you're okay with losing your creatures here's urbrask i hope you're okay with all of these praetors having haste and harming you here's gen Gitaxes. i hope you're okay with not having access to your spells and here's the other gen i hope you're okay with not having access to your hand here's shieldred I hope you're okay with a ticking time bomb of death. But of course, we can't really end just the ramp section. We do need to talk about the lands in the deck. We are running two of each basic land, Swamp Mountain and Island, with one of each Battle Bond land in here, the ones that come into play untapped if we have two or more opponents. For fetch lands, let's go ahead and put in a Seething Landscape for flavor and one of each correctly colored regular fetch land. We can also add in the Omni lands of Exotic Orchard, Command Tower, and Xander's Lounge. Xander's Lounge being one of the best additions as it is searchable with those fetch lands. Pain lands are a no-brainer in here as they come into play untapped and don't cost a whole lot monetarily to get. Shock lands are searchable, so let's go ahead and put every shock land in the deck. Let's go ahead and add in a copy of every slow land as well as the likelihood of these being online is very high. And since we have fetch lands and we are a deck that cares about our graveyard, let's add one of every surveil land to the deck two they are searchable and when they touch the battlefield we get to surveil one putting a thing into the graveyard the tango lands are also searchable and really if we happen to mill through our other searching lands these are wonderful to drop in it's easy to hit two of any basic lands and let's go ahead and have the utility lands of bajuka bog to take care of graveyards desolate lighthouse to give us a little extra draw and discard any demir aqueduct so that we can bounce up our mdfcs when they have been used up that all said, that should be enough mana to keep this deck humming and tooting along. But I know it's not enough to just say that's what we're going to be doing. So let's go ahead and go into the gameplay of the deck and show you exactly how this is going to be ran. So as for keepable hands with this deck, we do want some form of ramp, we want some form of draw, and we want access to all three colors in any opening hand. Looking at our hand right now, we really don't have a great set of options, but we do have a silly play. Anytime you have one of the lieutenants and reanimate, you can start the game off with a funny trick. Go ahead and open up the game, drawing your first card, and then go, oh, 
Well, I don't have a play. I'm going to discard Shieldred and pass my turn. If somebody doesn't immediately bajukabog you, then in the next turn, on turn two, you can play a land, tap it, play reanimate, and then boom, Shieldred is on the board, taking care of whatever card was on everybody's board immediately. If they've played any creatures or they've ramped into their commander on turn one, the Shieldred is taking care of all of that right now now next turn comes up and we have rising of the day we don't really need it too much what we can do is we can play scalding tarn crack it and go ahead and get a shock land out of the deck and we can cast talisman of creativity with that mana because let's be honest we really 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 did punish ourselves by losing that opening bit of mana next turn comes up and we have the worn power stone so let's see where we're at right now, we don't have the basic lands for the Sunken Hollow, so we'll let that come into play tapped, and we'll tap three to get the Worn Power Stone on the board. Now we'll have access to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mana on turn five, so we've effectively mitigated the downside of getting the Shieldred play open early. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to flip her. At this point, anybody who has even half a brain would have killed Shieldred. She's probably gone by this point, but that's okay. So we're going to end open our next turn up, turn five, play the island, and look at what we have available. We have seven mana available. We have no major plays, so we can play the Lightning Greaves, and we can play Rising of the Day so that we have haste on our follow-up turn. The next turn comes up. We can go ahead and play the training center, and now we can tap everything out to get our commander online on turn six. Not only will Sauron be coming out, but Shieldred will be coming out with him, and the orc army token will be coming out with a power of five. We also get to mill five cards when we do this, so if there happened to have been a better target in the five cards we milled, then we would have grabbed that. But as it stands right now, our Shieldred is a 5-5, five, five, our Sauron is a 10-9, and our Orc Army is a 5-5, five, five, and Rising of the Day is giving them all haste. So we are going to delete 15 life from one opponent after we've gotten rid of several creatures with Shieldred. Next turn comes up, and we've drawn a Shivan Reef. We can go ahead and play that Reef, and I think it's time to flip over the Shieldred by paying 5 mana. At this stage, we really can do whatever we want. If somebody kills our Sauron, we just threaten them with another reanimation. And if they don't kill our Sauron, then we have the true the true scriptures that's going to be going off in a couple turns. Honestly, we are in the dominant position. So, this is going to get rid of three cards from every opponent's hand and three cards from every opponent's deck after it's removed a creature from them. So turn eight comes around, True Scriptures goes off into its second mode. Everybody has lost almost every resource they have access to, but we can push those resources even further by tapping one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and put Archon of Cruelty on the board. Archon is going to cause an opponent to lose yet another creature and also draw us a card and also make them lose another card out of their hand. Meaning when turn nine comes around and the true scriptures flips over, we will reanimate everything from every graveyard all at once. And if we happen to lose our commander, our hand is filled with a land and two more ramp pieces. So it'll be super easy to go ahead and get him back online if need be. But as of right now, we've reanimated everybody's boards, and our board has haste, and our opponents likely don't have any moves at all that are available. So we basically just win here. And I'll do a second game, because normally we wouldn't do that over here on the channel, but all things considered, this is the kind of deck that has different game plans depending on which lieutenant you find first. So looking at this, we have draw, we have ramp, and we have all of our colors of mana. We don't have our silly reanimate play first, so let's go ahead and play a command tower and then move into turn two. We drew a watery grave, so we're going to shock that in, and I think... If our opponents have played a creature, we need to go ahead and remove it with the Virtue of Persistence. This is now in Exile, and we'll be able to cast it at a later date. Turn 3 comes up, and we can go ahead and play a Mountain, or, looking at where things are at, maybe the Smoldering Marsh is the better play, as we're going to only be spending 2 mana this turn anyway on Ripples of Undeath. This way, when turn 4 comes around, we can mill 1, 
two, three cards. And if we wanted to keep any of those cards, we could. Looking at it, though, we don't really need any of them in the immediate. So we're going to choose not to take any of them. Play Shiv and Wreath and pay one, two, three, four, and get the Relic of Sauron online. Now we have access to more mana for a follow-up turn. Next turn comes up, we're on turn five, and we can mill one, two, three. Now, where we're at right now, we have a few options. If we look at our graveyard, do we need any of these right now? We don't need the lands that we got uh, out of this, and we might not need the Solemn Simulacrum, but I don't think it hurts to pay one mana to get that Solemn Simulacrum to our hand. We do lose three life from that, but getting access to Sad Robot may prove better for us in the long run. We can pay one, two, three, four, Get Hedron Archive on the board, pay one, two, and then the Mountain for turn to get Solemn Simulacrum on the board, and now we can go into our deck and go ahead and get a land out. This gives us a maximum amount of land and ramp on the board. We have access to what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten mana on turn five now and the ability to make treasures in our hand. And we'll be able to put Urabrask into the graveyard with our setup as it is right now, if a better option doesn't make its way into the graveyard. So we're gonna move to turn six, and Ripples of Undeath is going to mill one, two, three cards. Anger is in the grave, so now we are set up for a perfect move. We can go ahead and pay one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, get Sauron on the board, milling one, two, three, four, and five. Looking at our graveyard right now, we don't have a super strong lieutenant to pull out. So we need to go for a different tact. We could pull up the, sto uh, the Pinnacle Monk, but that depends on us having a instant or sorcery in our grave that we really, really want. And looking at this right now, there isn't anything that we super need, but getting the monk out and going ahead and getting this big score to our hand may just be the best of the options that are there, as this will give us a very good follow-up turn. Remember, though, that because we have Anger in the Grave, our Orc army and our commander do have haste, so we can go ahead and swing everything willy-nilly at an opponent. We don't really care if we lose the Pinnacle Monk again, and we don't care if we lose the Sad Robot, so just aim everything at somebody's throat and harm them. Turn 7 comes around, and we're going to go ahead and mill our 3 with Ripples of Undeath. And while we have not found another uh, reanimation target, we are in a position where we can pay 4 and play Big Score in order to discard that Urabrask to the graveyard and draw 2 cards. We did get Toxic Deluge out of this, which may be perfect in this scenario. The deck is having to play without a Lieutenant right now, though, so we have to be very careful. We did get access to two treasures from that, though, but let's go ahead and pay one, two, three, and uh, eh, yeah, we'll go ahead and pay everything into it. We'll do Unexpected Windfall to discard a card again and push a little deeper into our deck. With our setup right now, we don't have a Lieutenant, so we don't really need the Lightning Greaves at the moment, so let's go ahead and toss that and draw two more and generate two more treasures. And lo and behold, we did find a lieutenant. There is Jin Kataxis Core Augur. So our next move is going to be to pay even more mana. And we're not really going to get rid of this treasure token. We're going to be sacrificing it and creating a new one. We're going to use Seize the Spoils to toss Jin into the grave and draw one, two more cards. With Jin in the grave, we can go ahead and use one of these treasures and cast Reanimate that we drew and get that djinn out of the graveyard. And since we have been putting down our land drops and we found some lands, let's go ahead and put Exotic Orchard down and look at our board state. If our opponents had a token deck, we have access to Toxic Deluge. And if our opponents wipe our board away, we have access to Too Greedily Too Deep to wipe our opponents' boards away in response while also getting a strong card. As of right now, though, we are going to end our turn drawing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cards. And out of all these cards, we don't need the Undersea Sewers. We don't need the basic land. We do not need this basic land, nor do we need 
the shock land here. So we can go ahead and operate off of this setup that we have right here. Everything in our hand is exactly what we need right now. Although there is an option. We could have kept this blood crypt and thrown away the Sphinx of the Second Sun so that we could reanimate it with one of our reanimation spells, which may actually be the move we go with. So when our next turn comes up, we move into turn eight. We get our one, two, three mil, and oh, well, let's go ahead and pay one mana, and let's get one of those cards we milled away, which is Breach the Multiverse. This changes our turn completely, because now we can just shock in this Blood Crypt, look at our opponents in the eye, and go, hey, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I cast Breach the Multiverse, milling one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And now I'm going to look in my graveyard and I am going to get back my Sphinx of the Second Sun. But as for you, uh, Mr. Opponent Person, whomever you may be, I'm going to take your best card from every single graveyard. Remember, Jin Kataxis has yanked away everybody's hands already. So I have access to all of their best cards. And I have access to a removal spell in my hand, two board wipes in my hand, another reanimate in my hand if need be, and I've got access to lots of mana that I will get back when Sphinx of the Second Sun gives me an extra end step. So, realistically, we're in an almost perfect position. Most decks do not have an answer to something like this. Losing their hand constantly, uh, us having constantly refreshed mana, and us having a mill ability that will allow us to constantly get more powerful cards in the graveyard throughout the game. All things considered, we've basically won at this point. We've put our opponents in a position where fighting back from this is almost impossible. And with everything having haste, we just turn it all sideways at the people who matter the most and end the game for the people we are most scared of. And remember, I'm not counting in the three creatures we've stolen from our opponents into this board state. There's probably at least 40 damage on this board if we count whatever the best cards we stole from their graveyards are. And again, I know that for gameplay, I normally would only do one pass through with the deck, but the deck does play incredibly differently depending on which lieutenant you manage to fish out of the deck first. And I think that's what I like the most about it, is that every game is going to end up being a little bit different because Sauron will change his entire game plan based on who he gets by his side. And that's what I find so fun about this kind of deck. Right now, I actually have my Marchesa Crimes deck still, but a lot of the pieces from that Marchesa deck fit really well into this Sauron deck, so I may be turning her into this Sauron deck IRL so that I have access to this deck in paper to play around with and tinker with and maybe do a Redux build later if I find something isn't working very well in it. Either way, I think this dude is ridiculously powerful, and I think you're gonna enjoy him a lot. I would put an upgrade section at the end here, but... I'm going to be honest, I don't think I can. We've already done this budgetless. If you want to add in dual lands and other silly crap, I can't stop you from doing that. All things considered, though, I really, really hope you enjoy this deck. I wanted this commander to work so badly when he came out, but now that I've got him functioning the way that I need, I am very excited for him. I thought he was a horrible commander when he came out, but now that I realize that he relies so much more on his 99 than almost any other commander I've played, that opens up a lot more opportunities for him that I didn't think he had previously. That all said, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you haven't already. Let me know what upgrades you would add in the deck. What lieutenants you would want to fish out of your graveyard and immediately bombard your opponents with. I want to hear in the comment section below what you've got. Let me know down there. As always, everybody, insert ended video tagline here. Hey, just wanted to give a quick thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who help keep me afloat and help keep this channel going. YouTube and Twitch are wonderful platforms, but at the end of the day, stability is not one of their strong suits. If you want to support my channel, then obviously Patreon is one of the best ways of doing that. Link is in the description. But I do want to personally thank everybody who has contributed to the channel. Those people would be Red Joker, Purple Poundini, Gemption, Briskrieg, Jupe the Malignant, Michael, 
Ravalern, Mabbity Babbity, Astral Frontier, Autumn and Angel, Nixie Chan, Agamotto, Victorian Alchemist, Sagitt... I'm not saying the last part of that, and you know that! Arctan Arc Lassier, Curatorian, Dren Hadamata, Jordan M, John L, Lord Bleck, Smiling Game Master, and Fire Shard. And everyone else who supports my channel and lets me do what I do full time. This is a dream job of mine that I never believed that I would be able to take full time, and with your help, I've been able to do it. So thank you so, so very much for that. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you all enjoy, and I hope you all are having a wonderful time. I will see you all in the next one, hopefully.